Ecology is the study of the relationships between organisms and their environment, who, hey, tend to be made up of other organisms. There's a lot of additional implications, bells and whistles you might say, that come attached to ecology. But really guys, it's the study of relationships. What shape exactly these interactions take can vary in an infinite amount of ways. Paired alongside other natural forces like evolution and geography, they form some of the strangest, most incredible ecosystems on the planet. Where am I going with this? I don't really want to tell you just yet. So let's move over to East Africa. Ah yes, East Africa. Home to the wildebeest migration, the Great Rift Valley, and the origin of our kind as we know it. Let's start by looking at dirt. In the humid, warm reaches of the earth by the equator, you will find stretches of terrain formed from a special soil called vertisol. Vertisols have many different regional names, and in the context of East Africa, are known as black cotton soil. This soil contains a high content of clay minerals, formed due to the volcanic nature of the East African terrain. As you may expect from volcanic soil, it is nutrient-rich, but most plants in fact struggle to grow on it. Water drains very slowly into the soil, and most noticeably, when dried, the soil can crack quite extremely. This cracking is enough to ensure that many plant species won't ever gain a foothold in the black cotton soil ecosystem. Only the hardiest flora can access the soil's nutrients. For instance, a savanna staple, the acacia tree. Acacias are already suited for their difficult lifestyle. Even just looking at an acacia branch, you see several traits. The branch looks almost like a feather. The multitude of very small leaves decreases the surface area water can transpire off of, thus conserving one of the more valuable resources of this arid region. Many species have thorns to defend themselves from the herbivorous animals of Africa. These range in size from deceptive, harmless-looking hooks that blend in with the leaves to ones with a more, um, obvious presentation, several centimeters in length. But out here on Vertisol land, only one species out of the many acacia species seems present, this easily pronounceable name, otherwise known as the Whistling Thorn Tree. The landscape in these areas is so strangely homogenous, with only a blanket of grass spread across the area and the same acacia species over and over again dotting the terrain. They get their name, Whistling Thorn, from the swollen bases of their thorns, which are punctured with small holes. Supposedly, with a strong enough breeze, this whole homogenous forest will whistle in unison. Why do only the Whistling Thorns persist? Well, aside from soil, there are other things that can hold back plants from surviving here, like elephants. You might not have heard, but elephants are really quite big, which gives them some nice upsides, but everything around them tons to sweat about. A lot can get lost in nature documentaries, and one thing often glossed over is how incredibly destructive elephants can be to their surroundings. To rural Africans, they can destroy fences and water tanks, and trample livestock and other valuable pieces of property. And looking past human communities, elephants can literally transform the entire ecosystem around them. This is what an environment looks like when elephants play a role in shaping it. It's the classic savanna escape, complete with a lonely acacia sticking out like an island in a sea of grass. This correlation between elephants and these more open environments is one that is in fact very important to ecologists, because elephants clearing trees affect more than just the acacia numbers. When the open bush is experimentally fenced off from herbivores like so, it suddenly stops getting so open, as plants who would normally get gobbled up are able to compete and thrive. Even the surviving acacia grow in different ways depending on the levels of herbivory. Protected from herbivory, acacia tree thorns reduce in size compared to their kind who must protect themselves. Of course, this natural refuge only exists when a forest is dense enough to protect plants from the wandering mouths of herbivores. And despite our usual tendencies, when elephants clear forests, it's not per se unnatural. Additional herbivorous fauna benefit from the clearing, 
feeding on plant matter they were once restricted from. One of the many herbivore species who are impacted by the elephanting of an area is cattle, a crucial species of livestock many East Africans rely on, who may benefit from the additional grazing space elephants create. So understanding what keeps these areas open and the black cotton land less so allows us to better understand the dynamics that keep animal, plant, and human life going. Elephants are herbivores, so making the connection between disappearing trees and them isn't far-fetched. Of course, it still doesn't answer why exactly the whistling thorn trees can survive in such numbers. I mean, most other acacia trees come equipped with some quite intimidating natural defenses. Those barbs and giant thorns intimidate small, squishier organisms like you and I. But they aren't really an obstacle at all for the animals known as mega herbivores. And elephants, the most mega of them all, often completely destroy the tree in the pursuit of some honestly petty ventures. Rarely do they go after the leaves of an acacia tree for nutrients. It's only in the dry season. Instead, elephants will rip out trees to create space to munch on low-lying forbs, the animal's preferred food. Sometimes they destroy trees just to make way for the rest of their sheer bulk, or to scratch themselves. Often, subadults will destroy trees to demonstrate their newfound physical power as a kind of rite of passage. We come to the feats of strength. Not the feats of strength. For whatever reason they do it, elephants often completely kill off an individual tree. They are excellent deforesters. But whistling thorn trees have the perfect defense against these animals, which happens to be more animals. Specifically, the very smallest, most minute animals you can think of. Ants. Those swollen thorns with little holes in them aren't just to produce a tune. It's housing for ants. They're actually visible on this branch right here, scuttling around their little bulb shelters called domitia. As well, the trees feed ants periodically through nectar secretions. In exchange for housing and food, the ants protect their tree fort, either from other insects, but most interestingly, from massive mega herbivores like elephants. They'll do what ants do best, swarming an animal, biting it incessantly until they leave the premises. And surprisingly, this tactic works where thorns fail, effectively driving away large herbivores. There are actually several species of ants that can bond with the whistling thorn acacia in this way, and although all are effective deterrents, each is more or less effective than the other. The best is Chromatogaster mimosae whose ultra-aggressive nature allows their trees to be protected at the greatest rate. Elephants sometimes succeed in taking down trees with other ant species on them, but almost never ones with C. mimosae. Regardless, the tree can spook off elephants in ways that the standard acacia defenses just don't keep up with, legitimizing a defensive strategy that relies on one of the most interesting mutualisms on the whole planet. This incredible strategy only succeeds to the extent it does because of the nutrient-rich black cotton soil. Without it, the whistling thorn trees would spend too much energy maintaining their defenses, dying due to a lack of available nutrients or outcompeted by more energy-cheap acacia species. Thus, it is only here in the black cotton uplands where the whistling trees, living cities housing insect residents, can truly dominate the landscape. The only way these forests and their ant residents can be effectively overturned is through fire, a natural element of the East African ecosystem. Acacia wood is actually quite well adapted to surviving the flames, but their insect partners either get scorched in the branches or flee underground, allowing for a brief pocket of time before recolonization where elephants can come in and knock them down. Something else that grievously affects the plant ant system is other ants. Currently, an invasive species known as the big-headed ants from islands in the Indian Ocean have begun expanding to the East African mainland. They are very effective at kicking out the other ant species from whistling thorn trees, taking it as their own keep. They aren't very good at protecting their keep, they just don't have that instinctive behavior for it thus letting elephants cut down these whistling thorn trees at unprecedented rates wherever they invade. 
affecting the rest of the ecosystem as well. It's quite possible they can be contained, but their story does show the delicate interweaving relations of ecology. And despite the tree clearing of elephants being perfectly natural, outside elements harming this balanced system, such as invasive species, or the consequences of fire repression, certainly aren't. These interweaving relations between elephants, ants, trees, fire, grazers, and us are some of the most fascinating ecological dynamics I have come across. Alas, only in pockets around East Africa is it being properly researched. One of the few is CLE, as well as other projects at the Mapala Research Center, where most of the footage in this video comes from. Thank you, Mapala. On the bright side, projects like CLE are hopefully just beginning to unravel how complex these black cotton saw ecosystems are. And I can promise you, if you pay attention, more incredible knowledge will come out about the ecology of the whistling forest. Hello, and thank you for watching. I will not go into details, but despite how short I kept this video, the data and research that went into this one means a lot to me. Uh, like I said, thank you, Klee and the rest of Mapala. As well, thank you to Dara Hughes for the wonderful music, and to the wonderful images and videos I used to make this. Thank you for watching, and... See ya.